First off, I just want to thank everyone at ThinkyCon for the amazing opportunity to speak today. I was so excited to see this convention and to be a part of it is really an honor. And thanks for the flexibility this morning with the timing. I really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Jeff Petriello. I am a producer at the New York Times working on the games team. And I'm here to give you some insight onto how we make new games at the New York Times. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I work with two squads, we call them, on the games team here at the Times. The new game squad, which is obviously most relevant to this chat today, but also the gameplay squad, which is focused, focused on developing new features for our existing players. So like letting you play the last two weeks of Spelling Bee, uh, which we launched last year, for instance, was a gameplay endeavor. So those are kind of where I divide my time. I'm also an adjunct faculty member teaching game design at the NYU Game Center, where I also got my MFA in game design. Uh, love still being a part of the community there. Shout out to anyone from there. Um, and just generally, I come from a multidisciplinary background in terms of production. I started in film and theater and worked my way into digital media, startup and news media. And then in 2017, went back to school for games. Uh, some of the games that I've produced include the launch of Connections. I hope some of you are familiar with that one. Most recently, the launch of Strands um, uh, in March at the New York Times. And before my time at the Times, I produced a game called Immortality, which won the BAFTA for Narrative last year, as well as a mobile game based off of HBO's Insecure. Uh, and on the side, I designed a tarot game called the Pasta Tarot, uh, which really drew from my queer Italian American identity. So check out any of those things if you want. But enough about me. I'm here to talk mostly about a process, surprise producer, um, but the New York Times Greenlight process is really how we make new games at the Times. It's a living process, so what you see here on this screen may very well change as we continue to go through, on, through it, but right now, this is sort of where we're at when we think of bringing a game from a concept all the way out to be part of our portfolio. There are seven phases to this, as you can see here. Um, I'm gonna speak on each of them briefly to different degrees. Um, but one thing I wanna note before we dive into them is that each of these phases, and the reason they are sort of like numbered like this is because at the end of each of them, we get a vote uh, that's made by what we call the concept committee here at the Times, which is sort of a subsection of the leadership on the games team that will look at the deliverables of each of these phases, have a discussion, and then decide, should the game be greenlit to the next phase, or is it time for us to focus our efforts elsewhere and sunset that concept wherever it's at? So keep that in mind as we go through here, at the end of each of these phases, there's a vote and we're deciding if it moves forward or not. So let's start with the concept. So I'm actually like not involved uh, with this part of the phase because the beautiful part is anyone can be. Um, so concepts for games are uh, primarily driven internally at the times and they can come from anyone in the company at any time. There's a template for submitting a, a game concept. You can make your own. You send it to the concept committee and they will review it. It's really awesome that we kind of have this like open door policy when it comes to uh, pitching games. That said, we do also want to facilitate their generation. So there's a couple other ways that we encourage pitches to come in. One is a volunteer game design working group. So members of the games team will volunteer for a few months to be part of a concentrated uh, group of folks who meet periodically to generate game pitches. And a lot of times these will be around shared interests. They can vote sort of like on the genres or types of puzzles they're interested in exploring. And the group will coalesce and sort of decide what they want to talk about, look at examples, maybe talk to some outside uh, folks who have expertise in that area, 
uh, or, or type of game, and then hopefully generate some cool ideas that they'll turn into these game pitches and submit to the concept committee. We also have some game jams at the times. We actually just had a really fun one last month. Um, and usually these are for two days. Everyone on the, on the games team gets the opportunity to you know, stop their regular work and focus on generating new ideas. Um, we have this really fun week at the times called Maker Week, where which is sort of similar, where you can work on anything you want for a week. And my last year's Maker Week project was creating a prototype cart to help facilitate the productivities of these game jams. So we affectionately named her Cardi B, and she is out in the office filled with all sorts of really fun paper prototyping tools to sort of facilitate, again, the generation of these ideas, just having them at hand. Shout out again to the NYU Game Center uh, where I modeled this cart off of. Um, and then finally, and more rarely, there are external opportunities. Obviously, the most famous one of these is Wordle, right? Wordle was sort of like lightning in a bottle. It almost felt like a times game even before it became a New York Times game. Officially, it was it was quick, it was daily, it involved language, it sort of like trick, like had a little touch of that brain exercise element. So, uh, you know, combined with the fact that it had a massive audience, it really was a special opportunity. So we are occasionally looking out there for uh, external ideas or pitches that could be a fit, but again, you know, 99% of our efforts are going to be driven um, internally. And if you are interested in learning more about how that Wordle acquisition happened and what we did, which I think is really interesting, once we had it, um, I really encourage you to check out a talk by my boss, our executive producer, Zoe Bell. She gave this at GDC two years ago. So if you have vault access there, uh, I recommend checking that out. Once a concept is greenlit by the concept committee, it basically goes into a backlog that gets prioritized by the concept committee. And that is the backlog that my squad works from. And that is when games enter sort of this phase two design and planning. New Games has entered the chat. Um, so a lot of key, uh, look, uh, the whole squad is involved, but there are especially some key folks um, who I just want to shout out. Our puzzle designer, Heidi Irwin, is the most involved at this stage and is uh, supported by our very talented product designer, Tatiana Moniz. And it, that work is then brought to the public to get some um, concept testing by our head of research, Juliet Steve, who I am so grateful to have as an incredible um, collaborator at the times. So what do we do during the designing planning phase? This is really when we sort of like take a concept and like poke at it. We flesh it out. We start a draft of a game design document that sort of like really outlines what's going on in the concept. Also calls out what are the open questions? What are areas that we may think of changing? How do we think about, you know, sharing, for instance, if that hasn't been a part of the pitch, right? All these kind of questions, Heidi will take a stab at outlining and developing and, and laying out. Um, another thing that we'll do during this phase is sort of outline a plan for like, if we did build this game into an interactable digital thing, what would that entail? What's the effort that taking this from design and planning and making a, you know, really putting effort into prototyping it would take. We want to get kind of like a feel for that. We also look at accessibility. So are there any big red flags or drop stats for accessibility with this concept? You know, how are we going to think about making this game accessible for the audience? And then finally, we'll do some concept testing during this phase. So once this idea is sort of flushed out, we'll actually just like ask people without telling them it's a New York Times concept, you know, what do you think about this? Is this an idea that's interesting to you? Could you see yourself playing it? Um, so this is a really important phase. And at the end of it, basically the concept committee is sort of like, now that we have a little bit more information on this pitch, do we want to dedicate you know, engineering effort to building out something that we could play with. And if the game makes it through this phase, it goes to the prototype phase, which is when our engineering team really comes in 
uh, hearts. We have a very a talented engineering manager, three engineers on the new game squad, and they'll be uh, really working hard on building up a prototype. I thought this would be a good place to sort of talk about some of the tools we use during this product because we're doing a lot of building and communicating and now there's way more people involved. So first of all, I want to mention our prototypes are built in React. All New York Times games are essentially browser games. And so our portfolio games utilize React. And so we want to, you know, if the game does wind up making it to that point, make that transition as easy as possible. So we're building these in React, maybe from uh, taking Heidi's paper prototype or Figma prototype or uh, smaller digital prototype and fleshing it out um, using some of the shared components that the rest of our games use. To manage that process, do task management and road mapping, we utilize Coda. And we'll be doing design feedback and iteration in Figma, all while communicating primarily in real time using Google Meet and asynchronous using Slack. So these are just a few of the tools that we use during this time. But prototype phase is really fun. It's when we get to sort of play test, give each other feedback, think about different colors or designs we want to use, and bring this concept into our hands, quite literally, and really play around with it and start getting feedback. So this is a really exciting phase. It takes roughly, I want to say, between one and two months, depending on the complexity of the concept. Um, but that's kind of like the maximum amount of time we would all linger here before we decide to move on or move forward, right? So this vote concept committee has the game in their hands. They can play it. They can experience probably like a few puzzles and uh, decide at this juncture, this is a really important vote, do we have confidence in bringing this to the audience of the New York Times? Because if the game makes it past prototyping, it goes to the public prototype test prep. And this is how it feels when we're doing uh, this phase. It's like putting on the good fit for this game. So before this state, we're concerned with being scrappy, efficient, not putting in uh, a ton of effort. A lot of times you have to imagine we're balancing multiple games at multiple phases in this, in this um, green light process. So it's always a balance here, right? Uh, we're trying to make that prototype as scrappily as we can to conserve resources. But once it hits phase four, we're basically saying, we're gonna really are almost positive that we're going to publish this at some point to the public. So we need to get it ready there. There's a ton that needs to happen at this stage not limited to QA. Up until this point, we're probably just QAing ourselves, picking out bugs, you know, our engineers and uh, our, our leadership just providing feedback to each other. But once we're in phase four, we're actually going to utilize like the actual QA team uh, and personnel that the New York Times games team has to uh, spot check all of our work and squash any bugs that come up. We want this to be a usable and obviously public facing product, it needs to be not buggy. Another way we do that is actually testing for usability. So before we tested for the concept, now we have something for um, users to play. We will run research sessions to spot perhaps UI areas of improvement where people are kind of like not getting what to do or uh, another big thing is our how to plays are sort of written instructions. Sometimes they have GIFs and things like that. Um, how clear are they? How effective are they? We're not going to be there to guide people, right? So can people pick up this game and play it uh, is really what we're trying to get at with those testing sessions. And another huge part of this phase is, of course, making the puzzles. So up until this point, most likely Heidi has just designed a few test puzzles for us to be playing around with. But at this point, we're talking about this game potentially going live to the public. We need to bring in our editorial team, like the actual puzzle makers, the folks who are going to be doing this work potentially for you know, um, perpetuity, right? So we need to start looping them in, really talk about what is the effort that needs to be put into this game? Who 
which editor would be a best fit for making these types of puzzles. So a huge collaboration with editorial needs to go down. And we also need to work with teams outside of the Gaiden's mission at this point, because again, we're talking about bringing something to the public. So we want to work with our brand team, which oversees the whole brand identity for anything New York Times. We'll work with them to finalize a name for the game, to, um, decide on a, a like sort of like a hero color for the game in our portfolio uh and an icon as well so a lot of big decisions are made in collaboration with the larger brand identity team and we'll clear you know uh, a lot with legal make sure the name is defendable and copyrightable we don't um you know really important for us to, to maintain that IP moving forward. So we just want to, you know, make sure um, everything's sort of like we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's there. And then another big part of it is preparing for feedback. So once our games are live in beta, we have a survey for people to give us feedback asynchronously. So we're going to be preparing that and making sure it's ready to go. And we'll also prepare our customer care team letting them know we're about to launch a new game. Please accept feed, please expect to uh, receive feedback on it. You know, give them the rundown, make sure everybody's sort of like plugged in. And there's just tons of little pieces of collaboration across teams, across squads on the games team to just make sure everybody is in the loop that this is going to go live. When is it, et cetera. Um, once all this work is done, and I will say this is the longest phase for um, the new game squad to be working on a game. If something makes it to phase four, that means that's where the bulk of our time and effort is going to be spent on it. So we're really in this for a while, trying to make sure everything's ready to go. And if it is, the uh, green light, uh, sorry, the concept committee will bring it to phase five, which is the actual public prototype test. So if you're playing strands right now, you're experiencing a game that's in phase five of our green light process. It's out in the world. People are able to play it. Important to note, it's only available on web. Again, we want to try, sort of be scrappy here. And all our games are essentially, again, browser games. It's the fastest place that we can get something out on. Um, and we're not necessarily marketing this game. There's no like promotion around it. We just sort of want to see what the response is and how people uh, engage with it. So during this, um, we sort of, you know, it feels like our baby is sort of like leaving our hands here. It's flying out into the world. Uh, we're sharing it with others. Some of the big things that we'll be doing during this phase are continuing to make those puzzles, uh, make sure we have enough in the backlog to feel confident about going out every day. Tracking performance, we'll have weekly performance meetings where we look at numbers like D1, D7, the amount of uh, people who are coming in just for this game, all sorts of nice, uh, interesting metrics, and monitoring feedback. So we'll run that survey. Our research team will give us updates on that survey and let us know if people are struggling with anything or requesting features consistently. And then I personally monitor our Zendesk. So if you ever send an email from a public beta game, I am the one that reads it. Um, I'm collating them, tagging them, sort of tracking bugs and elevating that feedback to our development team to sort of prioritize and monitor. Um, squashing bugs is obviously a big part of this. If anything comes up, we want this game to be playable uh, and uh, have a positive experience during the beta so we can get an accurate read on if people enjoy it. We also can iterate at this time. So uh, we can still make little changes. Um, we're considering doing some of that. Uh, we're actually working on some of that right now for strands. We want to get those changes out while the, it's still in this beta period to, to sort of test things. So this is a really exciting time. We learn a lot. And if at the end of it, our concept committee feels confident that this game should be brought in to the wider New York games, uh, New York Times games portfolio, become a permanent member of it, the game will go on to phase six and phase seven, which we call on all surfaces and on platform. And I'm going to speak um, about these together because A, they're a little similar, and B, I no longer am working on the game at this point. Um, we are trying to hand off the game once the beta is over and it's successful 
to the folks that are going to carry it for the rest of its tenure in our portfolio, which is the entire rest of the game's team. So uh, getting the game to be part of the New York Times game portfolio is a massive task. I cannot emphasize that enough. It's like, you know, a lot of feedback I'll get is like, you know, why isn't trans on the app yet? It's like, it, because it takes a very long time. Um, so one of the big things, as you'll see FaceX on all surfaces, is we want to get the game everywhere it should be. So it goes from being just a web experience to being one that is available on the New York Times Games app, on the New York Times News app to play. It's just really important that we indicate it's a permanent part of our portfolio and it's available everywhere just like the rest of our games. So that's gonna be a huge effort and I work with the rest of the games team to do a handoff at this point, make sure we really understand the architecture of what we designed, any existing bugs, and um, you know, essentially hand this game off to, to really grow up into being appear with the rest of our existing portfolio. Another big part of that is like developing admin tooling. So we don't want editorial to have to like scrappily make puzzles and figure out how, how to get them into a game. We want it to be as easy as possible. Uh, so we might build out tooling specific to the type of puzzle that it is to keep that a sustainable process. We may have to prepare the game for advertising, right? The launch of a new game in our portfolio is a huge opportunity on the business side. So making sure the technology is ready to integrate with our ad services is a big thing. And also just like general refactoring and re-architecturing to play into uh, making sure, for instance, these puzzles are plugged into our back end that we're tracking how users are, are progressing so that we can do future things like stats and streaks or an archive, if you will, something like that, um, like we do with past puzzles recently on uh, Spelling Bee. So a lot goes on here. This takes months and months and months, but at the end of it, we have a game that has been sort of assimilated, if you will, into the New York Times uh, portfolio, and uh, we are pledged to support it from then on. So I want to just leave like a minute or two for some self-reflection on this process. As I was putting this presentation together, I wanted to, you know, communicate. My, my main goal here was to be transparent, to provide some information into our process. The New York Times games team has really grown uh, over the last four years. Our games are now quite accessible and accessible to a way larger amount of the public than even when I started a couple years ago. Our New York Times Games app is in the top three free games on the iOS app store uh, this past week. So we are, you know, um, sort of at a new level here that I'm, I'm really proud of for our team. But it also means that we have a responsibility to be, I think, part of the larger industry more proactively. So that was a huge goal of mine. And this is not to say that I think anyone should necessarily copy this process, but I do hope it is insightful um, because every company, every studio I've worked for is really different. Uh, the people are different. The business goals are different. The culture is different. And your process for developing is going to be different than mine. Um, there's a great body of work called the playful production process that I really recommend. Ooh, uh, sorry, did not mean to do that. Um, by Richard Lamarchand that lays out a general process for developing new games that I really look up to, recommend, and utilize in a lot of my teaching. Um, but something like that, honestly, really wouldn't work in a company like the Times. So you have to sort of like land and iterate on what is working for you. And I, I really want to emphasize that iteration practice. This green light process, for instance, does not look the same as it did when Connections was out. It's something that we get feedback on, we constantly retro about, and are always looking to improve and update. So find what works for you, 100%. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. Um, and yeah, uh, 
Thanks for playing our games if you play them. And um, I would love to answer any questions or talk to anyone further, uh, you know, offline as well. I'm really happy to be a part of this ThinkingCon community. So thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, I was going to say, it's great to have somebody from New York Times with us because, um, like, your games are part of many of our, like, our daily routine is playing some of your games. Um, all righty. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. We had a few questions. We only have time for probably one. Um, so I'll ask the first one that came up. Well, it's a quite a funny question. How many external pictures did you get that were similar to Wordle? So going back to the beginning of your talk and early pictures. Yeah. Um, so not being on the concept me, I would not be privy uh, necessarily, yeah. but I can tell you tons of folks, you know, even reach out to me personally with obviously, especially if they're making word games. Mm -hmm. um, again, I want to emphasize like the, the reason that Wordle was so attractive to us at the times was like, obviously it really fit in with a lot of like the values that we have around our existing games, but also it had a huge, massive audience, right? So it wasn't just the puzzle that was intriguing to us, right? It was the fact that it, was a part of culture and the New York Times is very much in the business of being a part of our cultural lives, especially mm -hmm. in America. So, you know, I think that's a, that's a huge factor. <laughs> and, and as I was saying, it absolutely is a part of our culture. Thank you so much for joining us again and to everybody else. Uh, see you in a minute.